Leadership Institute. Darren served as the regional director of the triad in North Carolina for the uh, Bill Graham for governor campaign. Darren is originally from New Jersey, but attended school at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He graduated with a BA in political science and a minor in communication. While in school, Darren was the chair of the College Republicans and helped orchestrate a statewide five-day event entitled Quarrels Week. It was founded by the University of North Carolina at Greenbur Greensboro's College Republicans. He also helped start the Guilford County Young Republicans, where he was treasurer and finance director. To introduce our speaker, Aaron Iwicki. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Uh, today, I have the distinguished pleasure of introducing a good congressman, a congressman who serves on a good, sound principle of conservative ideals. Uh, congressman Mark Edward Souter was first elected to Congress in 1994 after working for then Senator Dan Coats from Indiana for 10 years uh, during Coates' tenure in the House and also in the Senate. A senior member of the House uh, Committee on Homeland Security, Congressman Sauter is the ranking member on Subcommittee on Border, Maritime, and Global Counterterrorism. He is also a senior member of the House Committee on Oversight, Government Reform, and the House Committee on Education and Labor. From 2001 to early 2007, Congressman Sauter served as chairman of the House Government Reform Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources. Subcommittee had jurisdiction over the domestic, international anti-drug efforts throughout the federal government, and it was the authorizing subcommittee of the, for the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP. In addition, the panel had oversight to several other agencies, including the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community, Community Initiatives and the National Park Service as well as the Department of Justice, Education, Health and Human Services, Commerce and Housing, and also Urban Development. In 2002, Congressman Souter's subcommittee released a comprehensive 100-page report on our nation's border security, the first ever such report issued by a congressional committee. Over the years, the subcommittee proceeded to conduct extensive hearings examining faith-based organizations in the national park system. In 2006, Congressman Sauter authored much of the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act, the most comprehensive anti-meth law ever passed by Congress. After that year, his ONDCP Reauthorization Act was signed into law. Through his committee and floor work, Congressman Sauter has been a champion of legislation to make faith-based organizations eligible to receive federal grants to help, to help address cultural problems such as drug addiction, teen pregnancy, and gang activity. The co-founder and co-chair of the National Parks Caucus is one of Congressman, Congress's strongest supporters of our nation's national parks, monuments, and historical sites. During the 106th Congress, the prestigious Congressional Quarterly magazine Named Sauter one of the most foremost effective conservative true believers. He and Senator Richard Luger were highlighted as CQ's top 50 leaders in the premier edition of the publication's honorary system or honorary list. Mark Sauter graduated from Leo High School. Won't say when. Uh, he then moved on to Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana University, where he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science and a Bachelor's of Science degree in uh, Business Administration. Now, these are his words, not mine. Had he not been elected uh, to Congress, perhaps his most significant achievement would have been his uh, involvement in naming the IPFW Mastodons while he was student body president. Sauter was one of the founders of the IF IPFW Alumni Association and the alumni one of the first alumni presidents uh, at the university. He received an MBA from the University of Notre Dame in 1974. You may have also seen his face during uh, television ads when he and three other 
Notre Dame graduates from Congress uh, shared airtime during Notre Dame football games as during commercials for the university. Mark's family founded Sodders of Grable in 1907. He is currently managing partner of Historic Sodders of Grable, which owns this land and buildings of Sodders General Store, the county shops of Grable, and his home and his home of Ellis Ruff Restaurant. Mark has been married to his wife, Diane, for 33 years. They have two, child, two grown children, Brooke and Nathan, and one teenage son, Zachary. The Sodders currently reside in Fort Wayne, where they attend Emanuel Community Church. Please give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Congressman Mark Sodder. Well, first, I want to get a, an unsolicited uh, plug for the Leadership Institute and for Morton Blackwell. As you know, uh, as Morton said, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, I was uh, one of uh, two college Republican votes to stop Karl Rove's takeover of the college Republicans. When Morton was uh, executive director, I flew to Arizona and proceeded to get mashed. Uh, the, uh, but then he paid the service back to me by managing my campaign for Young Americans for Freedom National Board, where Charlie Black proceeded to cheat his way uh, forward. Uh, Charlie uh, has done some good things and some not so good things in his career. But uh, it's interesting, as one of our friends from California, Bill Saracino, said, now we play with real bullets. Uh, back then, uh, we were uh, practicing. And that's literally what the Leadership Institute does for a lot of younger people. Morton had a newsletter called The Remnant. Uh, sometimes we feel like uh, we're still in the Nixon years, uh, but in, in those days it was fairly grim. What was going to happen to the conservative movement? We saw it first, uh, the first wave was wage and price controls, assault talks, a uh, number of things that, that Nixon did that caused a lot of angst in the conservative movement, to say the least. Uh, had Humphrey Dunham, we'd have called him socialist, uh, going to China. Uh, that uh, and then in '74 with Watergate, boy, does this feel familiar? The the different uh, challenges that we had in '74, whether we were going to survive as a part, Republican Party and as a movement, what kind of party it was going to be. Uh, uh, that's why '74 was a big watershed year. Uh, hopefully, um, we won't have two watershed years in a row in '06 and '08. Fear that when the other parties most conservative of their main candidates is Hillary Clinton, you know we're in deep trouble as a country. Uh, that, uh, but the, uh, he then founded a newsletter called The Remnant, and, and then, uh, which kept a lot, a lot of us in, in touch with each other. The Leadership Institute, my uh, son, uh, my youngest, our, our tail ender, the teenager, uh, is at Hillsdale College. And one uh, couple interesting things. First off, I went over, first time we went up on a Parents think you always wonder, and I walk into one of his friends' room, and there's this blonde bombshell on the wall, and then I realize it's Ann Coulter. This is not a main campus. Uh, you know, you see big X's over Hillary Clinton posters all through the, the school, and uh, one of his friends had transferred in. They call him Transfer Andy, uh, a very creative name, uh, that uh, because he transferred in from Minnesota, uh, partly because he came to a Leadership Institute program, came to Washington, then decided to switch to Hillsdale College, which, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is very conservative. Um, and another one of his friends had come through a Leadership Institute program, is now out with the Heritage Foundation, investing. Uh, the reason we're not going to die as a movement is, one, we practice uh, less abortion and birth control than the left. Uh, the, the second is, is that uh, uh, we invest in our young people. Leadership Institute has been a, a leader in that. And, Sometimes people who invest in organization wonder, is it really doing good? But hey, nobody's promised us victory. If you're a, a Christian who believes in the literal uh, uh, book of Revelation, it goes like this. What we don't know are the ups and downs in that. And to the degree we fight back, uh, God said in Sodom and Gomorrah it would be spared for just a few people. Hey, we've got a whole lot more than a few people just in this room. And in, in creating young people, you don't know where our ups and downs are going to be. Uh, what matters is whether you're in the battle. And I think the Leadership Institute helps keep us in the battle, uh, will keep us in the battle. And seeing young people with the, the solid values still coming up in the battle is really important. Now, I could go in lots of different areas. As you heard, uh, uh, I have a, a, a fairly uh, wide background. My subject this morning is the border. Now, let me, uh, I have to divert on one thing. When you work narcotics, like I've worked narcotics, it's led 
I never thought, I grew up in a small town of 700, it was, we thought it was a big deal if we saw assistant to the county commissioner, uh, that uh, yet alone being a congressman and getting to see different things. I used to read human events as a kid. I was very disillusioned. I formed one of the first high school YAF chapters in the country because I, in 1965, uh, because I could not figure out as a 14-year-old why Barry Goldwater lost to carry our hometown. Uh, and so I decided to do something about it and, and got, in, got involved. Uh, I memorized the voting records of people and human uh, uh, events in their annual report and the ACU and the CIO and the Pope ratings and uh, ADA, uh, 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 it wasn't ACU then, it was ACA and ADA and the Pope ratings. That, and so I followed it closely, but never thought I'd get involved. Our family had always been in the furniture business. I came from a small town. And then, you know, you, you'd read about, uh, mentioned Evo Morales. I mean, I've had the unique privilege of so-called meeting her, Evo Morales. Uh, that, um, but more than that, of, of Hugo Chavez. And when you listen to the rise of, of Castro, was he a communist or wasn't he a communist? Was he just using the communists? Those kind of questions. That when Hugo Chavez first took power, four of us went in to meet him, along with the first time that our ambassador came in. And I'm not convinced that he was actually um, as left as he is now. Partly he's just stupid. Uh, and, and that what happens is when you combine stupidity with basic um, uh, demagogic principles, because he was partly Peronist. Uh, in, in our first meeting with him, Bill Delahunt was along with me and Sam Farr and uh, Cass Ballinger. And in the middle of, uh, we were supposed to have like 15 minutes, went on for like an hour and a half, hour and 45. We were the first Americans he had, had a chance to really berate and, and, co and very charismatic, dynamic individual, which is similar to what a number of my, one of my Cuban roommates said about uh, Castro, is they'd send people down literally to assassinate him in this Castro's charisma. Sometimes they'd have a guy with a gun on him and they would back off. Uh, that, that he, uh, and Chavez has that same charisma that just energizes out of a, a, a body. And he, in the middle of it, he went on a tirade about homos and abortionists. And you go, what? And it came some from his Peronist upbringing, I think. And he went on this tirade about gays and how they should be killed and, and abortion was evil. And afterwards, I kept telling Delahan, I said, man, you picked strange allies. The first time I've ever seen you promoting an uh, anti-gay pro-life guy. Uh, that, um, but uh, that in, the, in this thing, Chavez said, the problem in Venezuela is the poor people need to get health care and education like the rich people. And he said, we're tired of the rich people just buying their way up on the top of the hill, and poor people need to live up on the top of the hill, too. Well, funny thing about economics, everybody can't live on the top of the hill. And if you don't know how the people got on the top of the hill, you're going to really mess up your economy, which is what he started to do with the oil companies and everything else. He had no concept of how actual capitalism worked there. And being not very bright and charismatic and demagogic, he, he literally told us, oh, Castro's economic systems failed. But I want to emulate Castro's finger in the eye of the United States because it has great popular appeal. And I want to become the new Castro in the sense of anti-Americanism, but I'd never let it take over economic because Cuba is a mess. But you can see kind of, as I've met him four different times, I refuse to meet with him anymore. Uh, but the man's basically just crazy. Evo Morales is the same thing. He started as a, as a regional politician with the Cocoleros. Uh, as we purchase and Europeans purchase cocaine, we create monsters. And that, that Evo Morales rose up representing the Cocoleros uh, in, in the uh, northern regions around Cochabamba. Then he got a, uh, when, we, when we tried to eradicate the coca, that group of farmers elect a politician. Then because he gets aligned with the other uh, pro-drug people that, once again, I want to repeat, that we've created with our uh, drug habits in the United States and Europe, they, they chew coca, but they, they had very little production of coca. The coca production and the problems in the Indian region arose as our habits arose in the United States and Europe. doesn't mean they don't, doesn't absolve them of responsibility. It's just that, hey, we've got a lot of responsibility too here because we've helped fund these monsters. Uh, uh, just like uh, uh, currently Chavez, uh, uh, basically a lot of what gets out of Colombia is going over Venezuela and we lose it. And he 
helps fund the FARC in, in Colombia, where we actually have a conservative, relatively speaking, uh, and relatively speaking, pro-American uh, government, uh, undermined heavily by the people around his borders. And now we have the same problem starting to occur in Ecuador and tipping around in, in Peru. It is a, a tough, tough region, not as tough as the Middle East, but almost as tough as the Middle East. Now, let me uh, start out knowing when I'm ever in any conservative group, the first thing you got to start with is the premises. Because uh, first, let me tell you my three premises about how we handle the border. One is I think that a country has a right to control its immigration problem. Uh, two, I believe there is, in fact, a war on terror. And uh, three, I'm against narcotics. Now, having come, grown up in the 60s and 70s, these principles were on the table in Young Americans for Freedom and the College Republicans back in the 60s because my, my friend Ron Paul, for example, doesn't agree with me on any of those three. I consider him my friend because he's the purest example of a libertarian in government. It doesn't mean I think one guy, when I told him that, he, uh, one libertarian back home says, you mean he's the pure constitutionalist example. No, I don't believe Ron Paul interprets the Constitution correctly, but I believe he's the purest example of which we can test ourselves because he's always up there as a no vote. But he believes consistently, like a libertarian should, in the legalization of cocaine and heroin. Ron uh, is against the war in Iraq, as, as they were against the draft uh, years ago. Well, now it's a voluntary military. But he would be anti, quote, the military-industrial complex. And he, do, and he believes in open borders, which are, are consistent with a true libertarian position. I am not. I am, uh, all conservatives have libertarian parts to you uh, as a fusionist. Uh, type of approach, but I would be more of a traditionalist, anchored in, in Judeo-Christian type principles and believe that there are balances to it in a philosophical world. Those premises are important as you tackle border questions. For example, the most controversial is the immigration question, because business economic conservatives want the labor demand. Uh, they may couch it in, in, in other things. In my district, the highest percent manufacturing left in the United States, business people want unfettered access to, to labor and believe, oh, they'll come in when we need them and go back home when they don't. Uh, that uh, uh, it, the drug uh, debate is still there, and a lot of people think we've overhyped the terrorist debate, which, which I don't. Now, taking the north and south borders, and I, I've been not to every border crossing, but a high percent, and the big ones in El Paso and San Isidro, uh, uh, Buffalo and Detroit, I've been at least uh, – pretty much once a year or once every two years to the border since I've been in Congress since 1994 and watched the evolution of this challenge. Let me just give you a couple of highlights. The, the north border is more of a terrorist threat than the south border. Because the immigration debate is so loaded um, and so controversial, just tearing apart at the grassroots and, and at, our, at our base in, in multiple different ways, um, a lot of people want to throw the terrorist debate into the south border, but, but the, the number of people on the, which this, if any of you are pure libertarians, this will just make your hair stand up to start with, so let me just warn you. People we watch, people on our watch list, or people on, who are actual higher target terrorists, uh, don't ask me what the people we're watching as opposed to the uh, watch list is. That, um, that uh, but uh, in that, we pick up a fair amount on the south border every month. But the number we pick up in the north border is four times as high. Now, it's not, uh, now there's a difference between Canada and Mexico, and it's important to establish this too. Sorry, this isn't a racist thing. Basically, it's harder to buy off a Canadian Mountie than it is a Mexican uh, policeman. I know that'll shock you. Uh, that, um, but that in the north border, we basically get much more accurate and cooperative police intelligence. With the conservative government in Canada, who hopefully we won't topple by embracing them, so in public we try to criticize the Canadian government because uh, any government that we praise anywhere in the world right now becomes in danger of falling. Uh, but that, but that Harper seems to be solidifying, and he understands the concept of of a North American perimeter, both in the Strategic Defense Initiative and other types of defense issues, but also in uh, how we handle immigration. Canada has previously had open immigration. It has been a huge challenge because like England, Germany, and France, they had many, many Arabs coming in. Now the real challenge is how many are inside, uh, in that, uh, which is our challenge in the Detroit area too and Buffalo area. If, if in Detroit area you have 220,000 Arab Americans minimum, uh, inside that you're going to have some bad people. 
doesn't mean most of them are. My campaign chairman is, is Arminian and Middle Eastern, and we have many down in Fort Wayne because of the proximity to Detroit. Many of them are most patriotic people, and quite frankly, if they don't give us tips, we're sunk. Uh, that that isn't that it isn't a question of discrimination. It's a question of logical profiling, and that is, is in in Canada, in Toronto, and Montreal, uh, we have uh, huge potential risks buried in there. Relatives that come in, people that come through, and and we need to have very harmonized standards between the United States and Canada. We're working at that. How, they were one of the last countries to give us the the lists on the airplanes. Um, that. The borders are a huge challenge because of bridges at uh, Buffalo and Detroit that cannot handle the capacity. Uh, and, uh, and increasingly, by the way, we're also seeing drugs move around the border. Vancouver is a mess. The biggest exported pro product now in, in British Columbia is drugs, uh, past timber uh, two years ago. Uh, I don't know how in the world they're going to do. I mean, isn't it hypocritical for the Olympics to go to a province? where they're going to try to maintain all these narcotic standards in a place where they've more or less legalized marijuana, quasi-legalized heroin through all the heroin needle distribution. And Vancouver, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, is in a mess because of all this heroin needle distribution that started as a very narrow program when we went up. We said, oh, we're just going to do it downtown. Then they had three more heroin needle distributions. Then the people are giving out the free needles now compete with each other in the street as to who can give out the most. Uh, they've now moved into the, the suburbs of, of Vancouver. They've had their first shootings of RCMP in years where they've had killings. They've had two staff people bribed in their, their local parliament. British Columbia is a mess, meth, mess. They have meth, but the biggest thing is hydroponic marijuana. The hydroponic marijuana is not the ditchweed type stuff that we used to see in our day of the, the uh, uh, amnesty acid, acid and abortion McGovern days. That uh, this stuff is... It, where we used to have four to eight percent THC content when in the '60s, which people romanticize. A lot of kids today, oh, let's go back to the Beatles. Let's go back to when they had weed and all this kind of stuff. Then they go out and get marijuana that's got THC of 20 to 40 percent that sells for more than cocaine in Boston and New York. If you can get it all the way from British Columbia, they sell the seeds uh, across the United States, and this stuff's very potent. If you see a hockey bag coming across the border, it's probably got a, a couple hundred pounds of marijuana in it. And that it is a huge problem in the northwest border, uh, heavily run by the Vietnamese. We think of immigration challenges and drug challenges as Mexican, but there it's Vietnamese and Asian coming across the, 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 the part of the northwest border, as well as uh, they call it Quebec gold coming east to Boston and uh, uh, New York, run heavily by motorcycle gangs and by the Aquasasne, former Mohawk reservation, up on the New York border, just like the uh, Tahorodom on the Arizona border that uh, they'll run in these places where they do contraband because narcotics are just a form of contraband. Contraband control is arguably the biggest challenge we have and the most direct challenge. We have 20,000 people die uh, with narcotics a year. Uh, so since 9-11, uh, we've had, uh, take that time six, about 120,000 people die of narcotics, but we're still in the 3,300 on the terrorism side. So the most imminent threat to us on a daily basis is narcotics deaths, not terrorism deaths. I never let the scale, uh, if you have an incident in terrorism, is so much higher that that's the waiting you do. The second thing is, is contraband's contraband. It, you can move cigarettes, then you can move anthrax. If you can move marijuana, you can move chemical and biological substances. It's, we don't have protection for contraband on our borders that we don't have protection in contraband. It doesn't matter what kind of contraband you're moving, whether it's a product, that uh, coming through our ports that puts a company out of uh, business because somebody stole your patent, whether it's anthrax, whether it's narcotics, or whether it's trying to get around the new high prices on cigarettes. Contraband is contraband, and one of our challenges on the border is how to stop contraband. Uh, that would be the narcotics thing. Obviously, the bigger problem is, is Southwest, uh, that in, uh, across from uh, uh, in Nuevo Laredo, six of the last seven sheriffs have been assassinated on the Mexican side. It tends to be a, a to have a problem when they shoot all your police officers, uh, that um, we have that problem uh, around. Anybody who's been to El Paso can see how Juarez moves uh, around, and it is a huge challenge to figure out how to how to control that that border. The trains that come in as it bends, the, the Mexicans uh, consistently, first the Dio, uh, then Fox, now Calderon, are doing the best they can from a decentralized 
government that is corrupt at the regional level to try to tackle the, the law enforcement problem is not a problem at, at, anymore at the top of Mexico. It was for a while when your drug czar is on the payroll and living in the apartment of a cartel. That tends to be a problem. Uh, but under uh, Fox and, and uh, Calderon, we're seeing improvements. There's going to be uh, a controversial um, uh, proposal this fall, which I'm actually going to support. Uh, to give aid to Calderon because I believe he really is trying to tackle the narcotics on the border question, and that it has become uh, critical for us getting any order. Uh, as we've passed uh, precursor controls for uh, pseudofedrin in the United States, obviously two things happen. One is it's coming in heavily from Mexico via uh, China and India via Mexico, uh, not so much produced in Mexico, but through Mexico. And the second is the Internet, which is a whole other challenge. You can buy Canadian pharmaceuticals, uh, about 20% of which are from Canada, about 80% which are fake internet companies with a Canadian uh, post office box uh, that uh, uh, seniors who buy Canadian drugs aren't buying them from Canada. Most of them are coming direct from China and India via Mexico or via post office box in Canada. So can meth. And we are uh, having to work increasingly with FedEx, UPS, uh, DHL, and others because it's the shipping that's going to have to control this because uh, we can't track the computer. You don't even know what the person's using their real name on a computer. Uh, so you have to track the packages, uh, and that's going to be a, a huge challenge. Now let me, um, uh, I, I touched briefly on, on terrorism, uh, briefly on uh, contraband. Let me tackle immigration for a second. I'm a fence person. Uh, that I believe that we committed 700 miles of fence. Uh, the administration and Chertoff believe we committed 370. Uh, uh, it's not clear when they'll get to 370, but they're building it steadily and fast. The counterattack from the media, uh, which is starting just like any time you do one thing, there's a pushback, and they're aided by the administration, who is absolutely furious that we sunk the immigration bill. Just let me, let me make a first declaration of where I am. I'm in between in immigration, and there is no in between. Uh, I am a border first. I'm a secure ID. But I believe you have to increase our immigration quota, H-1Bs, and I believe that the idea of deporting 15 million people is absurd. We can't even get cocaine dealers deported if we can find them. Uh, nevertheless, I do not believe in citizenship because I do not believe in rewarding people who broke the law. Now, how we work it out in legal status is a huge question because one of the big things, and particularly for a conservative Christian, it's a huge challenge on the family question. But obviously, we cannot have this family migration question where one person turns into 64, because then we're not dealing with 15 million, we're dealing with hundreds of million. The Senate bill was a catastrophe, it, and, and we made a strong effort in the House to sink it that last day. Paul Rove, uh, John Shattig, and Pete Hookster and I engineered that, boxed the, our leadership in to go on record to sink it in that, that final thing, and Paul Rove and the administration were furious. And my, my belief is that part of what's occurring right now uh, is a mad rush to put some fence up, to try to get one more vote. Uh, it's an uh, attempt by ICE doing uh, illogical uh, random raids on businesses who have no way to verify who they have in their company because Social Security won't release the information, but they're trying to increase the political pressure on us to try to generate some kind of immigration bill because in case you haven't heard, President Bush is hunting for some legacy other than Iraq. Uh, that uh, And in this uh, challenge, um, and hopefully it won't be no child left behind, that, uh, that, uh, because, but he doesn't have very many things to grab here at the tail end. Uh, so we're looking at, at a very tough uh, last year. So, but ultimately what this comes down to is any type of resolution of status has to have border control. Otherwise, there's no resolution. Interestingly, the number of intercepts on the southwest border has dropped unbelievably dramatically uh, uh, in over the summer. Two, two things. One is, guess what takes care of the immigration problem first? A little softness in the economy uh, will slow immigration down really rapidly. The second thing is it dropped immediately when the Senate bill was defeated because this economy started to soften six, nine months ago. Obviously, if there aren't any jobs, you stop coming unless you think getting into the United States may get you status for when the economy comes back. Defeating the Senate bill more or less had a huge drop. Now, the administration would like to say we've toughened up the border. We've toughened up the border, but we, in case you haven't heard, have a long way to go. Uh, we also have another challenge that even as we build fence, and fence 
obviously they cut the fence, they climb over the fence, they put ramps on the fence. I, I, I held the only real pure hearing on fence where we looked at different kinds of fencing. We have all kinds, in El Paso alone, we'll have triple fence, single fence, all, or all sorts of fences trying to deal with the, the challenges that the courts give us. Like we, nobody, can, anybody gets cut on the fence, we get sued and unbelievable. Uh, that, uh, that the, but the fence slows people down enough. If they have to use a blowtorch and we pass it up, if they have to go over the top, then you don't, otherwise you have to have people all the way along. Here you can mash your border patrol and when the moves occur, plus the vehicles with the huge loads of things are, are uh, uh, tougher uh, to move. So we need as much fence as possible, except in the areas where it's really mountainous. And I'm, I'm for everything. I'm for the, the SBI net electronics. There's nothing wrong with electronics. But guess what? People and electronics are a lot more expensive than a fence. To the degree you can put a fence in and then go to the others as supplements, that's what you do. The administration wants to always make this either or. You're for Border Patrol, you're for the fence. You're for electronics or you're for a fence. No, you need them all if we're really going to make this thing secure, and it's going to cost a fair amount of money. But until we make it secure, any immigration bill reform will be a magnet, not a control mechanism, not a solution. We've been through this. We've, we're, we're going to fix the border twice before. Every time, what it really is is a goal to give amnesty and no control. Secondly, I held one hearing in North Carolina, for example, where we were dealing with this, this mother who who I can't remember where her son was killed or her daughter-in-law was killed, and the other is, is comatose from a DUI who was an illegal. But he had been already deported in Michigan for DUI. He had already been deported in Wyoming. Well, it just comes back um, that until you control the border, it doesn't matter what we do for status or resolution. People will just keep coming back, which leads us to something that has been very controversial, but is no, there is no choice. You can, uh, let me take it, conservatives for years have, been against a national ID. We've been against the national ID as they get as their billfold is filled with national IDs. Uh, Amazon and, and uh, uh, eBay know more about you than than anybody else. Uh, that uh, except maybe your credit card company. And that uh, and you have a social security number. Uh, we have a small group of conservatives who still fight that, but but uh, most people have a social security number and a tax ID number, and we're filled with with numbers. Uh, after you after 9/11, you suddenly realize that. Um, as you get into the secure ID thing in the book of Revelation where it says 666 will be uh, on the beast's forehead and that, that we'll have to have uh, ID to buy and sell, you realize it's conservatives will be demanding that and then it'll be misused by the beast. It's not that the numbers, Ill we already have to have a number. People ask your, your all kinds of numbers when you go to, to buy and sell. We've already moved into that. Uh, the question is how is the number going to be abused and to stop people from abusing the number? Because without a secure ID, everything's a farce. Uh, uh, right now, um, uh, and that means fingerprint, uh, and it has to be multiple fingerprints because the drug dealers cut off and, and the terrorists cut off one or two fingers. That's no challenge. That's why we had to go to eight uh, overseas. You, you look at the deaths, uh, we can't begin to spell, uh, and quite frankly, many of these terrorist suspects can't spell their own name right either. The A's and the E's get turned around and they have more vowels and consonants in their names. Uh, if you actually go to the immigration desk, as, as I have in, in Islamabad, and look at who comes in there, and that, that while I was there, they got one guy that was on a watch list. They had 25 different aliases and spellings to his name. Uh, uh, if, if you don't have a fingerprint there, you don't have a clue who's in front of you. Uh, that uh, stand at an airport with the security guy and watch the, the uh, uh, people's driver's licenses come through. Quite frankly, women in particular, it's like, if you get it within the same decade, you're lucky. Uh, uh, within two might be actually good for many people. Uh, it, it, you, you can't do it with a picture ID. It's, it's a joke. And that, that employers uh, need to have, and, and we have people working towards basically being able to put your hand down and say, that's you. Uh, my wife's best friend tried to get a credit card for the people who had her name. It's helping her social security account, but she had to prove she was the one. Uh, all the identity theft in America, there's not a ton of, of stealing of your credit cards anymore. They're stealing your social security numbers. They've raided Purdue and stole a bunch of them. They just got a big company up in, in Michigan last last weekend over in Western Ohio. Uh, they, they went in and stole all the birth certificates in one county because, hey, uh, and then you mass reproduce them. If you're a Hispanic surnamed American, there's an estimate that you who are a citizen that your name may have been stolen 20,000 times now being used to come in. There's no excuse for being caught by ICE, because if you get a 
a good fake ID, they can't find you. It's only when you go with cheap fake IDs, like you're Hispanic and your name's Mark Sauer, uh, that if you, if you can figure out how to match your picture, a name, and a social security number, all social security will tell you is that uh, there are several people with that name. So until we get a secure ID, which the key thing is the reader. North Carolina went to a secure ID, but they don't have the readers. There's one in Charlotte, because it costs about $3,000. And we get that down, and we're getting close to $10, 15 then we'll be able to, to track this. Furthermore, it's a great money laundering question uh, that I had uh, one of my friends who was over at AID, now represents direct sellers. He came to one of my breakfasts and said, uh, by the way, Mark, I, I represent direct sellers. Uh, who exactly? Oh, Avon, Mary Kay, Amway, uh, Chackley, uh, Herbal Life, uh, that uh, every single one of them would fall under an immigration bill of ver employee verification. Because as, whether it's your family or your partners, or depending which one you're in, they're all business people. They're all moving money through. They're all uh, working for each other. You get paid off, off commissions. And this whole network, how many of them do it? He said, I said, how many do I have in my district? So he went and checked. One of them is my wife. I uh, worked with Discovery Toys. Uh, uh, 30,000 uh, direct sellers in my district. Uh, that, but if we don't keep track of that, this is an incredible money laundering scheme for any illegal immigrant organization or terrorist organization to move money through. Uh, that this is going to get more sophisticated as, as we move. Uh, a couple other, uh, uh, I'm a, let, me, let me mention these two things and then I'll. Uh, 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 move on that um, to questions that the border is an incredible challenge uh, in, in immigration. Uh, each area is a uh, different challenge uh, that uh, let me give you a, a just a, the environmental challenges in the border are just huge. We're not supposed to touch the Rio Grande uh, that there are some of these weeds grow up really high and we're not allowed to cut them. Uh, that uh, in one area of San Diego where we first put the fence in, there, was, there were big holes in the fence for a drainage thing. And I asked why that was, was there. And they said, because some kind of snail darter or something was, was there. I said, don't they just run through there? Yes. So they killed whatever was ever there in the first place. Because of course, they went for the hole in the fence. Then you see the orange marking. So we can't go in there as Border Patrol agents because some kind of bird hatches there. Well, what do the illegals do? Well, they run for those areas and trample them to death. Uh, that, there's not even logic in the environmental of how we handle this, but we have uh, uh, that as we, we control parts of the border, they move through the Barry Goldwater uh, range, they, they move through cities, uh, and uh, this is not going to be easy, but we're working at it. I said uh, two more things. I'm going to do uh, two more quick ones. One was the, the uh, so-called Millennium Bomber shows the challenge we face when we're looking for the terrorist inside the huge numbers we're doing. He had gone back and forth across our borders more, multiple times. But in the end, as he targeted the LAX airport, and uh, this has all been well documented, he went from Montreal, drove across Canada to Vancouver, took a ferry to Victoria, then took the last ferry of the day to Port Angeles, where we caught him. And then his, he was planning to go down to LAX and meet with somebody who was crossing another border crossing. That shows a sophistication and a dedication to how difficult it is when you're looking for needles in haystacks. Uh, now, our border, uh, our customs person at that point, uh, caught him. And I met with Deanna Dean. She said it was the last person of the day. A lot of this is just experience of our agents. She said he was the last, he was last on the little ferry boat at Port Angeles, which is 10,000, 12,000 people. Uh, uh, at the edge of Olympic National Park, not the least crossing you expect a terrorist to be coming across, uh, that um, she said he seemed nervous. So we detained him. On that basis, uh, I, I know she couldn't have been profiling. Uh, that, uh, but she pulled him over, and then when they opened the trunk, he decided to make a run for it. Uh, another one of the agents ran him down. They thought he had a portable meth lab in his, his, his trunk. But it turned because he had these big things that turned out to be nitroglycerin, uh, would have taken out more people at LAX in their plan and the diagrams they had than World Trade Center. That uh, and that uh, at the end, I she said, you know, I I've heard you on Dr. Dobson, and I said, yeah. She said, so 
And she said, I presume you're a Christian. She said, yes. She said, this is known as the praying post of the customs. We have a Bible study every morning. And she said, we believe that God delivered us, uh, this person. She said it was so random that we actually caught it. Now, as much as I believe in prayer and as strong as I believe in Bible study, and I really gr it's great we have a praying post, that's not a border strategy. Uh, that um, you have to be wise in how you approach things in addition to that, and that uh, is a challenge. Then my favorite terrible story, uh, uh, which as of June they still hadn't resolved, but I haven't heard in the last three months. At a, uh, there's a place um, uh, east of El Paso, Neely's Crossing, where uh, uh, they... Rio Grande at that point is not the powerful Rio Grande of songs. It's a series of puddles uh, that uh, sometimes interconnect in a, a rainfall. And there is a gravel area there that gives it more of a solid base for the uh, trucks to, to run, uh, basically loads of narcotics. There the narcotics group is so strong in that zone, I think it's Marfa sector, that the Im illegal immigrants don't run through there. The drug people keep them out because uh, they, they want to have a, a controlled area and the Mexican government stays out or they kill them, uh, including the military. Uh, at Neely's Crossing, when I went there, it's right at a border between Marfa and it may be El, El Paso sector. I was there with multiple uh, border patrol people and their command structure. We had just had a very celebrated case where we got an SUV with they believe had 20,000 pounds of marijuana. Uh, they're not sure because the truck tried to come up the bank and got stuck. And when it got stuck, um, it tried to back up and we saw it uh, and got a lot of Border Patrol in. But they jumped out with more guns than we had, uh, significantly more guns, told our guys to back up. We negotiated that if we could take um, uh, the load, uh, they could have their truck back, which gives you an idea of how much they're running. They'll give up 20,000 pounds to get the truck. Uh, that uh, They got about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds out. That's how they made their guesstimate of how much was in there. They came back with their guns and said, the bulldozer's ready. Uh, you didn't get it out fast enough. We're taking it all back, which also gives you, means a bulldozer getting there to pull it out is of more value than 20,000 pounds of marijuana. Uh, understanding you usually deal with ounces. Uh, that... Um, that in the, uh, when I was there, they have moved a bulldozer into that point in the woods. <clears throat> and when the bulldozer started up, they said, we've got to get out of here. It's not safe. Uh, something's going to happen. I'm telling you, when you have a, the regional commanders and that many border patrol with you, and a bulldozer starts up the other side, and they said, we better run. We've got a problem. Uh, when I talked to the Mexican ambassador and he said, what do we have to do to get some kind of compromise and work on the border? I said, first, take out the bulldozer. Until you can get enough control of your border to take out the bulldozer or give us an F-16 strike where we can take out the bulldozer, if you've got an active bulldozer to move that much stuff, I mean, my lands, high-value targets are high-value targets. That it's eight to 12,000 to smuggle uh, an immigrant across, 30,000 for somebody from the Middle East, uh, you get a high value target. Uh, if you if you can smuggle that much drugs, you can smuggle anything. Contraband is contraband. People are people. It's just a question of negotiating the price. We have to get control of the border. I gave you a few horror stories with it. Every day we're making some progress. Uh, ultimately, you have to have the secure ID cards because the last thing I will say is our biggest problem is visa overstay. I, I meant to say this. We are part of the reason we're seeing less arrests on the border is people are going to dinner in El Paso and staying 20 years or 40 years. That the penalty for uh, uh, stay, overstaying a visa is so minimal. Uh, and the, the coyotes that run them, uh, the detention centers that we've done with OTMs, other than Mexicans, those are a whole series of points. But our biggest problem right now is visa overstays, because without secure IDs, why would you run through the desert? Unless you're an absolute idiot. Uh, why would you run through the desert? Part of it's the coyotes moving large numbers of people. If any of you have any questions, I can go into that some. But one of our huge challenges right now, uh, we believe that it moved to as much as 80% of the illegals are now coming in from visa overstays. Uh, biggest thing, uh, more common number is 60%. But there's very little disagreement on Homeland Security that our biggest challenge is visa overstays. The more control we get in the border, unless we resolve the internal crisis, 
why in the world wouldn't you just say, I'm going to visit a relative, I'm going to Disney World, I'm going to, to uh, I'm going on vacation. Uh, or if you're a student, why do you leave? Uh, it, it is a, a huge challenge. With that, I threw out a whole range of, of different things there, gave you some idea. I'm, I'm hopeful that we're making substantial progress, but the resolution to the final questions are very, very difficult, of which much of this pivots on the ID. Thank you very much. I, I can stay for questions. I know I hit 9 o'clock, but uh, I'll stay for a little bit. So go here, here, and here. Why don't I take all three together and... Uh, will you please address the NAFTA highway which is being built or proposed between Mexico across the United States into Canada? Bring the microphone here. Let me get several of these together. How oh, much they want. Yeah, the I'm reading from the DEA pamphlet. Uh, drugs are readily available to America's youth. Uh, as a retired police officer, I helped to spend a trillion dollars in the last 36 years to bring us to the point. Uh, do you still see the uh, Do you still see prohibition as the best approach and the war on drugs as the best strategy for these dangerous drugs? Why don't we take that one too, and then I'll then I'll pick up yours out, uh, sir. Thank you for your outstanding presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, I work for a company that's putting in uh, a majority of the fence. Uh, we're we're getting fired on now, putting the balusters in. You mentioned uh, uh, the arms use. Uh, I'm I'm kind of curious. What are we looking at for a solution for that when we can't even have normal workers putting in the balusters without being shot at? Um, the uh, let me start with the last question first. That this is this is this is when you become a cynical, perverse conservative. Getting shot at is good news. Now, in a, in a way, in Colombia, the only way we can tell we're actually succeeding is when they try to shoot down our planes or kill the police officer. Because if they aren't shooting, it means they, they're, like one of the problems we used to have in the southwest border is they just abandoned loads of cocaine when we come at it. The fact that they're willing to fight now on illegal immigrants and on narcotics means that we are, in fact, doing some damage. Because one of the questions on the, on the price question of does the war on drugs do any good is is that if if they they merely can write it off as bad debts in other words the government seizes five percent so you move them out you're growing and shipping up by to 105 percent if your government seizes 10 you move it up to 110 one of the only ways we can tell that we're doing damage on both one or other of, of those two things is if they fight back now the problem with fighting back is People building the fence are getting shot at, and the people are getting shot at in Colombia. I don't see this as changing. Uh, I th see this particularly as you move into terrorism, and if, if we happen to stumble on a high-value target or somebody who wants to keep that open on the north border or south border, it's going to get more violent. The IEDs we're seeing in Iraq, we're going to see in the United States, and other tactics like that. We've been immune to that. Ireland hasn't. Uh, other countries haven't uh, around the world where there's conflict. There's going to be conflict. The question is, is, can we stay even or slightly ahead to interrelate with the, the narcotics question that the, uh, we have had experiments with cutting back on the war on drugs and moving solely to what Nancy Reagan said, you don't win a war by just treating the wounded. I'm a big drug treatment person. You have to do drug treatment person. I'm safe in drug-free schools even though it's relatively ineffective. I'm a big one for the national ad campaign even though it's relatively ineffective. The, the, the truth is, is that the people who want to cut back on DEA and the law enforcement say they want to do prevention and treatment. Prevention and treatment doesn't work either. Legalizing it and managing it, which is the Ron Paul question of treating it like cigarettes, uh, what you see is that, that it's not clear that in addiction, particularly in addiction, if, if you legalize marijuana consistently, you have to legalize cocaine and, and heroin because otherwise it's not like the people who sell marijuana are going to go, oh, I'll give up my billion dollar industry, they'll move to other things. Uh, that means you're going to legalize meth. There, it's a slippery slope. If you believe, as I do, that the root problem is sin, uh, in a broad, a broad sense. In other words, people are tempted to use things when they're discouraged, when they're challenged, when they need to get up to, to, to work, uh, not sleep for two nights. 
they're going to use illegal substances. Every day, somebody who's been through a drug treatment program, who's been through uh, or is always in danger of falling back. Somebody, a kid in school thinks they're immune to this, then they get jilted by their girlfriend or boyfriend and they're at a party and all of a sudden, bang, all this stuff's gone. But every time we back up, the problem got worse. That, 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 let me give you another kind of corollary. Uh, divorce has gone down in the United States under Coolidge, Eisenhower, and Reagan. Does that mean elected Republican divorce goes down? Or does it mean when the culture changes, it has a bigger impact on uh, divorce? Uh, probably. The, the country is becoming more conservative. They elected somebody with certain values, and that was reflected in the standards. That, that when we tend to have more anti-drug, it tends to be when the country is culturally more conservative, and it flatlines or declines. We have had a steady 5% reduction in drug use in the United States ever since George Bush was elected. The problem was is that in 19, night between, we had had it from the time Reagan won until 1990, we had had steady decline. 90 to 92, to be fair, flat, flat line. But it's, it's tough. Uh, once you get down to harder core people, as opposed to the, the superficial, you're dealing with harder core people, new people coming in off of the things, people going through seven treatment programs the seventh time, they're not using as much as the first time, but it takes a long uh, process. Clinton said, I didn't inhale. He cut the drug interdiction budget down, uh, uh, basically obliterated it. Uh, and uh, cut the, the drug czar's office from 120 people to 20 people. In that period, drug use went up from in the first two years of the Clinton administration by so much that it takes 10 years of 5% reductions to equal what it went up in two years. So you constantly have these waves. What we've had is stability in the war on drugs and a fairly steady but more difficult decline as it moves down. There's a certain level where, where it may flatline. I would argue that it's been relatively effective. I, it's not clear to me who's most likely to be shooting at this fence, whether it's uh, the people running immigrants or the people running narcotics. My bet is that the people running illegal immigrants are uh, uh, enabled to switch over to the visa overstays. You're probably seeing it from narcotics people, depending on the type of fence. Uh, I'm going to briefly switch to the NAFTA highway and then come back to one more point. Uh, I do not sense the same threat. I, I get a fair amount of letters on the, on the so-called NAFTA highway. The, NAFTA is an incredibly complicated issue. I, I would have opposed it had I been in Congress at the time uh, because I had a manufacturing base that needed to buy time, and I didn't believe that it was going to do that. On the other hand, in Indiana and in the North, we've done so much of an increase with Canada that it's pretty well offset what we lost to Mexico. The, the question is, is if you're going to make things like I do in my district, uh, can, can we move them to market? What, what, uh, there, there are arguments about whether it's precisely ever going to be built the way it's being talked. But I-69, as it moves from Indianapolis down to Memphis, would uh, most people are talking about this big multi-lane thing moving through Texas. But it's really part of our interstate highway system, uh, obviously without control of the border. It's a disaster. I'm more focused on the trucks. Uh, I believe we've had a discriminatory standard under NAFTA that allows inferior Mexican trucks, less clearance of Mexican trucks, rather than American trucks. And if we get control of the border points and get control of the trucks, it, uh, then we're down to do you believe in trade or don't you believe in trade? And how should that trade be fair? What's a balance to that trade? How are we going to deal with this? Quite frankly, Mexico right now in the labor market is getting clobbered by China. Uh, that NAFTA tend in the labor question, not the drugs and immigration question, but the labor question really is a tad, uh, a tad uh, 80s. That uh, Mexico now can't compete with China in labor. Uh, and that, that the goods that are coming in, it, it's more of a question of getting control of the goods at our border what standards are going to have on China currency, how we're going to handle India, uh, and, and we may need the, the uh, coalition of Canada, uh, U.S., and Mexico, which is a change in my philosophy to combat the Asian threat of, of the ASEAN, ASEAN people who are billion, uh, which Indonesia is the biggest part of China, and India uh, may be the longer-term threat. On the, on the um, one last, uh, uh, well, 
uh, the, the, the challenge on the, the, the uh, violence is not helped by the, the two agents that, that whatever the complicating variables are and there are, when we lock up our own Border Patrol agents for trying to fight back, it's, it's uh, making it uh, uh, very difficult to figure out how to protect the people building the fence and how to do this. When you don't allow your National Guard to be armored, uh, armed, uh, and the position is when there's a bunch of them coming to you, back up, uh, th th which is the position we have with the guard on the border. Uh, I was told by the Border Patrol the guard aren't trained, and I said, I venture to say that they're more trained than you are. They said, yes, but they're not trained to how to handle people in the difficult situations we have. What do you think they're trained for in riots in Indiana uh, and other places? That's part of their fundamental training, that part of this is our union battles over who who gets to be on the border, who gets to do what functions. Uh, but clearly, if that violence escalates, uh, we're going to have to deal with it. One, I mentioned coyotes. For those of you who don't know, those are the runners. And part of the, what he's running into is who's going through the desert. If my premise is correct that visa overstays are higher, the people going through the desert where we're building the fence are the most violent because that that uh, partly they're the drug people, partly they're the people smuggling the illegals who can't risk getting stopped. The estimate is we stop 20% at a border crossing. But that means we know the numerator but not the denominator because we don't know how many illegals are coming. So that's just a wild guess. Uh, what we know is we get the 20%. That, uh, and uh, we get a figure on the top and they estimate the, the bottom and therefore they came up with 20%. But if you have it, let's take 20% if, if that's a number that you're going to get caught, that's fairly high if you're smuggling a terrorist because they could be locked up forever. Uh, or we used to be able to send them to Guantanamo. Uh, that um, now they might get internet access and healthcare, but it'd still be not mobile. Uh, that um, that in the in the challenge here is that the coyotes, partly if they're running uh, 20 people, and let's say you catch four, and they've been paid 12,000 to get them up to Indiana to the RV industry. Uh, or 16,000, depending where they're at from Mexico, that, that the whole group's moving. They've rented their vans. They've got the, the green cards and so on, and, and four of them got stopped. Well, that's an inconvenient. In fact, the next day through, one more of them is going to get stopped. So the coyotes tend to run the desert if they've got a group package, and, that, and they're also handling then a larger amounts of money because the, you contract with a coyote, which is like a travel agency, uh, uh, you can, you can, you can. If you can get yourself up to the border, it's about eight hundred dollars, four hundred some points, thousand maybe at a couple other points. So to just do the jump over the border and then have a relative meet you on the other side. If you just need the van, it's just like a travel thing. Do you want a one star, two star, three star, four star, five star package? And that that, um, but that the coyotes are the ones running the five star packages, uh, seven, you know, and they're getting everything set up for you. Uh, in that challenge, that means that when you're building the fence, you're running in to the people who have the most financial stake in something, uh, the, the coyotes, the terrorists, and the drug people. Go there. In January 1990, I testified before uh, the Coast Guard subcommittee on a bill to shoot down drug smuggling airplanes. And I just heard on C-SPAN a uh, ad admiral of the Coast Guard saying that last year they finally got permission to shoot at uh, high-speed boats that were smuggling in stuff. Could you make some comments as to why it took 16 years to pass a bill that allows the Coast Guard to shoot down the drug smugglers? The, um, uh, that uh, it, it's... Uh, when you, when you get into the details, it, it's kind of messy. Let me give you some, some examples. That uh, Compion and uh, Plank on the second guy, the, the Border Patrol people in prison, uh, are uh, in there because they, the Border Patrol says they didn't know it was a drug dealer because the incident occurred before they checked the vehicle. I'm sorry if you're going at high speed in the desert in between nowhere. Odds are you're not coming over for dinner. Uh, that, yeah, we didn't know whether he was a drug dealer at the time, uh, but similar with, with some of this, this kind of stuff. This, we had the shoot-down policy for airplanes in Colombia and, and Peru, and our undercover agents would provide the, the tactical intelligence. They would have 
uh, natives on board in the plane and uh, where we were giving them the intelligence so we didn't get uh, you know, a whole bunch of hot water. And then, uh, then uh, but the planes that shot them down were not Americans because we, we claim we don't use lethal force. Uh, you can see now how that claim works. That uh, this was incredibly messed up when we shot down a missionary in Peru. Uh, that they were a missionary family, they were coming along the river, uh, that there was absolutely no reason they should have been shot down. In fact, our guy on board was yelling into the radio, no mas, no mas, because the plane was not using uh, uh, any evasive techniques. It had merely failed to file their flight plan, but, flight plan, but since they'd used that route on a regular basis, and when they, they couldn't see its tail number, but when they saw the tail number, they realized, uh-oh, that caused one negative incident will, will, will drive policy. One lawsuit in the United States drives policy. We don't make policy on what's best. We make it on risk. And risk means uh, any one thing goes bad, the whole system panics. That panicked everything. We finally got Colombia back up and running again and, and, and Peru up and running. And one of our biggest battles was the Republican Attorney General's office wanted to prosecute the classified person who gave the information. And all of a sudden, the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA didn't want to provide us any information anymore for fear they're going to get sued by their own government when we weren't even doing it. So part of the challenges is that. Now, on the other side of the coin, I was uh, just, uh, uh, I don't know when, two months ago or so, down in Florida over to the Bahamas. Bahamas are a bigger challenge in a terrorist sense right now than the Mexican border, although anytime you don't know what's going on, it's always a danger. But the Bahamas were picking up not only Haitians and Cubans, but increasingly Middle Easterners. And there's a thousand islands there. And the go-fast boats are going like crazy. And when you're flying over in an airplane and you're looking down, there's just no way to tell because they're moving like crazy. And I mean, somebody coming over Bimini to, uh, and then run his boat back, you can't hit him thinking he's a drug dealer. Uh, unless you have tips, it's just about impossible. And then the tips, uh, sometimes uh, anybody who reads espionage, hey, that's narcotics, it's terrorism, it's, it's, it's the war. Tips can be working three different directions. Sometimes a tip means go get this guy because it's a decoy and then you don't have it and you hit it and you're watching and then you're watching the watchers and you, you have this at San Rosidro, you have this in the boat. That, uh, so what they've done is non-lethal force. Uh, in other words, uh, for, for a long time, and I argued this first with, with the drug people, now with the, the Homeland Security people and Coast Guard, of why can't you hit the engine? Well, we couldn't hit the engine for fear something would ricochet off. Uh, that, uh, but now they can surround it, and they can take out an engine depending on how confident they are, knowing they could get sued. Uh, but we still, you know, can't shoot people. But you can disable boats and in airplanes. Other than uh, in Colombia, Peru, where the, those countries have those policies, we can't hit airplanes. The problem when we see these planes coming is now. Because our intelligence is so much better, but bluntly put, so many assets have been diverted over to the Middle East, that of our, our, our P-3 planes, all 16 are down. We've, we've leased a couple of Canadians to try to get them up. We are relatively blind from being able to intercept. So the whole question of shooting down is more or less irrelevant right now. Uh, our, our Coast Guard boats, if there's any kind of warning to pull back in, anything. Coast Guard is so multitask right now that they go running back home. We only have a couple out. So we're seeing this stuff move. We lose them over uh, Cuba sometimes, although Cuba sometimes helps us. We lose them coming out of Venezuela. We can see them move, come out of Venezuela, try to pick them up again. Uh, interestingly, we lose them in Haiti, but drug dealers tend not to stop in Haiti because the people there don't stay bought. Uh, uh, Haiti's bad for drug dealers and for anybody that's so disorganized. Uh, but you you lose them at different places. So, but that shows you some of the difficulty of this. I believe they should able, be able to at least use non-lethal force and use force down policies. And uh, we had this problem, and I harassed Bonner uh, on this. And the Port Angeles case made the biggest uh, break there. Is it used to be our DHS agents weren't allowed to pursue more than a couple hundred yards off of the port of entry, and the guy who ran down the Millennium Bomber broke the law by running him down and catching him 
And that's when they changed that policy because we've been hounding them and hounding them. And they realized they would have lost the bomber uh, if, if they hadn't been allowed to do that. So we have, in effect, the same thing in medicine where people practice defensive medicine uh, rather than uh, and run up costs is what we're doing in a lot of narcotics and terrorism. My opinion is that uh, when the next terrorist attack occurs in the United States, in the next numbers over the five years, eight years, particularly as Iraq uh, draws down, uh, we're going to see major attitude changes in the United States as to what things we're allowed to do in intercepts. Right now, the risk is perceived low, so there's more risk in the armed forces and in in um, uh, law enforcement about the risk of making an error than there is focused on an actual intercept. Uh, this was early on in Iraq, and that started to change in Iraq. We were so busy prosecuting our own guys, sometimes we forgot to get the terrorists. Uh, and this same challenge is in law enforcement. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stay around here for a few minutes. Mark, thank you so much, so much. I, uh, perfectly obvious uh, to me and everybody here that you are not only a deeply uh, committed person to uh, important values, you are also extremely knowledgeable and hardworking, and gee, I'm glad uh, you're in the Congress. As a token of our appreciation, um, let me present to you uh, one of the Leadership Institute's Adam Smith Necktie. Uh, actually, uh, as Don Lipsitz's health was failing, um, he uh, and he knew that he didn't have long uh, uh, to go, he came to me and he said, Morton, you've been wearing Adam Smith ties uh, faithfully for decades, um, and I'm not going to be able to stay in this business uh, for long. Would you be willing to undertake the responsibility for uh, keeping this tradition alive. And of course, the Adam Smith neckties were the club tie for Reaganites in the, in the Reagan administration and club tie for the conservative movement. And, uh, and uh, he, he warned me that you're not going to make any money on it, he says, because the rag trade is a rough trade. Um, but I, I agreed to do it, and so we, we have done it. And uh, uh, this is one of Lipsitz's models. We have an arrangement. We made an arrangement with him before his death. And when we re reproduced ties that were made by Don Lipsitz of the Decatur shop, um, when we uh, produced one of those, the, his design, the design of his wife, we, we pay uh, his widow, Norma Lipsitz, a, uh, a royalty for each one of their designs. The one you have there is, uh, however, a Leadership Institute design, designed by my former assistant and our former vice president of administration, Amy Green. Um, I uh, invite you all to join us on Wednesday, October 3rd. Our next breakfast speaker will be Ambassador Joshua Joseph Wu. Um, he is the representative for the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, which is essentially at the embassy of the Republic of China on Taiwan, and his talk will be entitled Taiwan and the U.S. Allies of Interest in Security, Prosperity, and Democracy. It's going to be a very interesting presentation. Uh, any of you who would like a tour of the building immediately following this breakfast should meet here at the podium on that side, right over there. Uh, you'll uh, depart immediately for a tour. Our Vice President for Development, Steve Bishop here, will uh, be uh, happy to lead you on the tour. I thank you all for coming and wish you'll come back often. You're right.